Hello gamers, and thank you for tuning into another episode of The Cartridge Club. The Cartridge Club is a community of gamers, collectors, content creators, and gaming enthusiasts of all generations. The show that you're listening to right now is effectively a monthly book club, but for gamers. We pick a game, invite everyone in the club to play along, and select a couple of community members to come on the show and discuss the game. My name is Ryan, aka it's Rocket Sauce, and I'm one of the hosts for this show. Without any further ado, let me introduce the panel for this month. From the YouTube channel, The Retrolectors, we have Mike. Hello, Mike. How are you? Pretty good. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. We also have the marvelous Mighty Q-Dog, Eric. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Thanks I'm really glad here. to be on now uh, with uh, the new hosts of the Cartridge Club for the first time. Well, we appreciate you being here. So thank you very much for helping us out tonight. And we have from Flock of Nerds, we have Miles. How's it going, buddy? Hello, Ryan. How's it going? I'm glad to be here, but it's actually the Flock of Nerds. Oh. You know, as executive <laughs> producer, you would know that. Come on. Well, I made a change, so it's just going to be Flock of Nerds from now on. So <laughs> Fair. Okay. <laughs> and with that done and out of the way, I'm going to hand it over to my co-host, Musty Hobbit, to let us know what game we are playing for this month. Musty? Thank you, Ryan, and hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Cartridge Club, where we are uh, here live for our YouTube audience yet again. Uh, so if you have missed out on an opportunity to watch us do this show live and are so inclined, you can definitely come check us out. This month, month of May, we are playing a uh, Sega classic uh, from the Dreamcast era. We are talking about Shenmue, and it's going to be an interesting show. I have a feeling that it's going to go in a lot of different directions. We're pretty excited about all of this. But before we get started, we always like to start off our shows with a little bit of a breakdown. Boasting one of the largest production and marketing budgets of any video game as of the time of its release, Shenmue was released on the Dreamcast in late December 1999, despite initial plans to produce it as an RPG set in the Virtua Fighter universe for the Sega Saturn. Creator Yu Suzuki, also known for other Sega hits such as Space Harrier, Outrun, and the aforementioned Virtua Fighter, wanted to expand his game experiences into the home environment and move away from the short burst gameplay provided by his arcade experiences. Shenmue is credited for naming and popularizing quick-time events and pioneered many features that are commonplace in modern open-world games such as day-night cycles, a persistent clock, and NPC routines. The Shenmue series is widely regarded even to this day, with the third installment scheduled to release in the coming months. For some of this, this was our first time dipping our toes in the series, with the rest of us being seasoned veterans. But let's hear from our panel and get their overall thoughts of Shenmue. Shenmue, more like Shen Poo, am I right, guys? I said it. That was fast. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a love fast, story Miles. about two people. One... Uh, a boy whose father is hit by a car and and he's left penniless like a street urchin and two a girl who you barely see <laughs> so i was you know i i thought this game was going to be pretty good because i love yakuza and everybody tells me boy you like yakuza you got to try out that first you know prime package of walking sim beat em up realness Shenmue and I was like what is this Shenmue so when I heard you guys are doing it for the club I thought this was the perfect opportunity for me to try it and I was not disappointed it is a powerhouse of a game that still holds its own to this day from everything from the uh one piece of voice acting that it has to the forklifts oh dear lord the forklifts this game has it all I'm I'm sensing I can't tell what you're doing right now, Miles. <laughs> so so did you did you actually like it? I'm not sure. Okay, well we'll <laughs> we'll we'll get to the bottom of that then. But thank you and thank you for being here, Mike. You are our Dreamcast aficionado, uh, and <laughs> so uh, when we when we picked this game, we we're like we have to have we have to have Mike on, of course. And this was also one of your, in some of the videos that you've done recently, this was very highly regarded uh, when you were talking about Dreamcast games. So I want to hear your overall impressions on well, Shenmue. Well, like, like I said, I've, I've loved this game from the first time I've ever played it. I've, I've had it, I think I bought it roughly around Christmas, maybe January of 1999 when I originally got my Dreamcast for the first time. And 
even though I was like dumbfounded by the scale of it, because there was so much to do. I didn't know exactly what to do because filling out a notebook, I didn't know where I was supposed to be going and, and trying to, you know, piece that all together, which, which was something that I haven't played like anything in like in the past. So that usually you're in a, in a, a game that you're in open world or sorry, you're in a linear style game where you're going, you know, point A to point B and, you know, hacking and slashing or doing whatever type of gameplay you're doing. This took me to like convenience stores and arcades and going to uh, different locales, uh, the docks, which I got extremely lost in when I first played it. I, I didn't know where the hell I was going. When I played that for the first time, I like, even though I didn't know I was what I was doing, I still enjoyed it. The story, even though it's 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 a good piece of story, good piece of content, but the fact that there there's still so much mystery behind what has to be unfolded, still like made me want to play more and made it enjoy made me enjoy it a lot more. Like I said, uh, like going to the docks, even though like the like uh, Miles said that the vocabulary and and the the people talking was very one sided, very monotone and all that. You would think that that would turn me off. It still didn't. It still got me wanting to know what is going to happen to Rio. So I was still looking forward to everything that that did unfold. Great. So were you like day one on on this when it came out, or were when it well, pretty much? Like I said, I, I don't remember okay. exactly when I bought it, but it was like in the '99 because I got my Dreamcast at launch, and it was either '99 or early 2000 when I first grabbed it. And like uh, like I said, when I played it for the first time. I was dumbfounded, even like the, the product placements. You know, I never saw Timex on, on screen. I had one on my wrist at that point. Yeah. An indie yeah. cool watch, right? So seeing that on screen was pretty cool. You know, the, uh, the time of day, the weather effects, all that took into like the draw of the game. And that's why I enjoyed it a lot more because I felt like I was more drawn into, you know, the weather effects. You can only come out at night. Certain characters only come out at night. Certain things only happen when you see Santa Claus on street on the street during around <laughs> Christmas time. You know, that, that was, that was dumbfounding to me. It was, I was really, really enthralled by that. Very good. Very good. So, so we have uh, miles in, in that just recently played it for the first time, but has experience in other games similar to the genre. Mike, you are a long time uh, game player here, Eric. Uh, you're a first timer for this as well. And I know that you are uh, big on Sega, but mm -hmm. tell me uh, your overall thoughts on the game. I'm very, very curious to hear where you're at. Absolutely. So the Sega Dreamcast is one of the systems I followed from before it was launched. And, and Shenmue was one of those games that they had been talking about for, I would say, at least a year, if not longer, prior to its its launch. And I remember there being a lot of hype for this game. And, you know, we were hearing things like you mentioned, this gigantic budget and this thing called free, this full reactive eyes entertainment and and there were all these things, like Mike mentioned, the weather effects. And I remember hearing a lot actually also about the facial animations, how those, how they were making that look real. And, and, and just this, the vastness of this game, this, this incredible game. And so um, I got mine, uh, I got my copy uh, pretty early also on the Dreamcast. It was one of the, one of the earlier games I got and I never played it. It's been about 20 years, and so when the Cartridge Club said they were going to play Shenmue, I decided that maybe it was time, and it had sort of built up into this legendary status, this game, and I wondered how well it would do uh, experiencing it uh, 20 years later, and I got to tell you, uh, I, I started it out, I was a little slow, a little lukewarm on it, but even now, even in 2019, I uh, I was really impressed with it, uh, really, in, uh, really impressed with the graphics, with the scope, with what they were trying to do. I, I very greatly enjoyed uh, the different things they tried to do in terms of the gameplay. And so uh, I, I definitely peaked in, in disc two. And again, I played it on the Dreamcast. So I, was, I started out slow and I, I definitely warmed up to it in disc two. And then disc three is the one where it's all the forklifts, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And so I guess I'd say I'm, I am a fan. Very I'm good. a fan of Shenmue. And uh, I've told myself I'm going to go right into the next game uh, now that I've played the first one. There you go. Well, another person who's a huge fan of Shenmue is the one, my co-host, who is the one who selected this game because uh, it is very, very high on his list. So I, I am entirely at at his uh, on his recommendation. So Ryan, give us your overall thoughts on Shenmue. So 
saying this off the bat. I, I did play this back back in the day when it released, when I got my Dreamcast. It was one of those ones where I remember reading, I believe, in the gaming magazines that it was like really, really well praised. And that's generally how I went off renting games or purchasing games was mostly by critic reviews. And this one was notably really well regarded by the critics from what I read through maybe even EGM. And I remember when I went to go pick it up, I bought it used and it was used. It, 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 the game was fairly new. Like I bought it around the holiday season and I remember buying that and Resident Evil Code Veronica for my Dreamcast. And I brought the disc up or the case up to purchase it. And the clerk told me, oh, this game sucks. It's awful. I hate the, you know, I'm like, oh, what's really? What's up with that? And I'm like, I remember hearing how, wonder, you know, one, or reading how wonderful this game is. And he's like, all you do is go around and ask people questions and ask for sailors. That's stupid. And I'm like, oh, whatever. You know, I wasn't listening to him. I was going by the critic reviews and I took it home and I powered it up and I could see the slowness to it because it is a little slow, but it, it was just one of those things where it sucked. I, I sunk into this game. I, I loved it. Something about the world. It really was. It, it's. I find it really relaxing, this game. And I, I, I guess I really love the story behind it. It's kind of like an old fashioned Kung Fu revenge story. You know, you, you walk home. That, the opening of the game is Rio comes home and your father's murdered right in front of you. And he's not like murdered with like guns and knives. He's killed with like straight up like touch of death you know it's kind of like uh i i was like oh man this is i don't know I, I i think i just love the the idea of someone being so badass that they can just kill you with like a, a palm strike or something like that and i it, it from that part was, i was kind of interested and then the more and more i got into the game the more i loved it um now it's not my favorite game of all time but it's like number two on my list along with the sequel following it up and it, it really comes down to like I, I guess I say like I'm uh, I'm always hesitant to replay the Shinmu games, and this is probably the fourth time I've I've beaten Shenmu in my life. I, it's not like some of the other games I played multiple times in my life. I'm always worried that if I keep playing this game, I'm gonna like it less. So it's it's one of those ones where I, if I'm gonna play it, I I try to space it out yearly. But it's been a few years since I've played this game and its sequel. So I've been you know after beating it this time around, I moved on to the sequel because. It's been a while, and I wanted a refresher for, for diving into the third game. So, yeah, and obvi- obviously the timing of this is intentional with mm-hmm. the third game coming out in August, right? Correct. Um, yeah, so we wanted to give people an opportunity. I, th- I think that's one of the things with our game selections in the past is that sometimes we'll pick a sequel or we'll pick a game that is hot and trendy in the in the moment, but sometimes that doesn't set things up very well for people who aren't into the series, and so this was kind of a departure from that. And I think, I think it was a good decision to play it. And we'll get into a lot of the specifics, Ryan, on, on, on where you're at with that. Mm-hmm. Now I will give you my opinions on this and they aren't going to be all bad, but my experience with this game was frustrating. There are some aspects of this game that are great features of a game and and i'll i don't want to tell you what those are necessarily right now but a lot of this game drags for me a lot i felt like it was quite slow i felt like a lot of the like intention behind your your actions is uh questionable uh at times i worry about this main character and what his actual like motivating factors are because he does not seem like he's a great individual (laughs) But I did like some of the things that happened later in the game, uh, and we can get into that. But I, I just, I found that although I tried to look through this game through the lens of somebody who was playing it 20 years ago, there are games that have done this more recently and in, in a better fashion. And so this game felt very dated to me for that reason, even though I was playing the remaster. And so I know I was playing the remaster, uh, Eric... Uh, Ryan and Mike, you said you were playing it on Dreamcast. And then Miles, were you? I was playing it on the HD remaster and the PS4. You were doing the remaster as well. Okay. Yeah, I did the remaster. You did the remaster too. Okay. I think that some of those things may come into play because as I understand things like fast travel were not a feature of the original. Some of our experience may, may shift just a little bit there. But 
let's let's roll into the game because obviously you know that's what we're here to talk about and i kind of want to kick off by let me have ryan let me have you tell us a little bit about our lead character uh rio so rio is uh He's 18 years old, and uh, the funny thing about this here at the beginning here for Ryu is the day he comes home is the day he turns 18. Uh, his, you know, the day he, he the opening of the game is his, his birthday, uh, and that's the day his father dies. But essentially, he's kind of a stubborn. Uh, he he doesn't really, really think things out too. He he's just kind of a stubborn a stubborn person. But once he's on this path of revenge, you know, like he kind of. Um, he doesn't listen to people too much. And um, I, this doing a little bit of research here and reading, I actually have a couple of these old strategy guides here. They, they go in a little bit more depth of, you know, with Rio here too, like explains why he's kind of um, like a bad boyfriend, if you will, to his girlfriend. He's a lousy boyfriend. Yeah. Like he is like the, uh, um, so, so they, they explain to him that when he was younger in, in the Prima guide here, they say that he was a real ladies man, and then eventually he got made fun of it for it. So after since getting made fun of made of, made fun for it, doing such being such a person, he kind of toned back his ways with like with the ladies. But I, I, from my understanding too, he was a much more caring person, you know, before this incident happened, and the results of you know I guess it's explained kind of through the game is like you know he feeds a cat you know he feeds a kitten that's lost its mother or got ran over yeah prior to being his father being murdered so you know if, if your choice to do it if you want if your choice uh you can feed the cat and eventually the kitten gets better but th so there's little signs like that that he actually still is a good person but he's still hell-bent on revenge that you know he's got his blinders on and he doesn't really think things through I can see that uh on the comment of him being being a lousy boyfriend, though, this game takes place over December and into the new year, and his interactions with his girlfriend are are few and far between, and I don't get it. Like, I get somebody being aloof because, like you said, he, he um, was made fun of being a ladies' man when he was younger, but he has what seems to be a steady girlfriend. I don't yeah. see what the problem is there. So... This is kind of just backtracking a little bit here too. Sure. Is saying like his friends know who he was that he's a caring person, but because of the result of his father being murdered, like they even kind of say like Nao Nozomi says, you know, you know, I care about you, and he just kind of goes, you know, you know, and Tom even worries about him. Tom, you know, who's his buddy, the hot the guy from the hot dog stand. He uh, kind of saying like, what are you doing and everything too, and he's just he's he's kind of prior to now you don't see it. You know, in this game, you only see it from the incident going forward, but it's at least hinted that he was a much more caring person prior. Granted, being stubborn, wow. but he was a much more caring person prior. Now, like I said, it's not implied in this game. You have to, you know, read books, you know, explaining his little bit of a backstory. And the stuff peels back a little bit more, the more diver, you, further you get into the franchise, too. So... So can I ask a question? Because I didn't, I didn't realize. I I thought they were just friends, because everything I saw said that Nozomi was kind of secretly in love with him, which seems odd. I guess if they're, mm -hmm. I didn't think they were boyfriend and girlfriend. I thought they were just friends. Where where does that come hmm. from? That they're because I mean, that's it, tough. It makes, I, it, I, it makes that, it, that is a good point. I don't know. I I didn't have. I don't don't have a manual to work off of. Eric, I, I couldn't agree with you more. When Ryan was talking, I felt like I missed a cutscene. I actually do think I missed a cutscene, though, because I think I got his father and a cat mixed up. I thought his <laughs> father got hit by a car and the cat got the finger of death. Like, that was weird. I played the whole game thinking that was all about my dad getting hit by a car. But what yeah. a game. Yeah, they never really <laughs> discuss it in the game. Like, they, you know, the pictures that are taken with you and the little subtle hints that there could have been something, but it never really sh like touched much on it. It's just like, it's just in passing. So I guess maybe if you're reading about it, like Ryan was doing and, and trying to piece some of this stuff together again, this is not really about a love story. It's about the revenge of his father. So right. how would you feel if your dad got murdered? I don't think you'd be very, you know, involved with that many things. Right. So you're trying to, to do the revenge plot. And again, I think there was a lot of stuff that was, probably taken out because of you know budget costs and 
the the story may have not have developed in a certain way. Like there could have been maybe even uh, you know choices with when you decide to te- to speak to Nozomi. Maybe that was taken out and that was you know a direct. Your main goal is find Landy. Uh, however, if you're stepping on the little people or stepping on people on the way there, uh, that's not the focus. The focus is on real getting to Landy as as the game goes. So you, you are right. I I just quickly ran into their wiki to just check, and and it does say that she has a crush on him, but Rio doesn't really have. He has mixed feelings. For some reason, I thought there was something in there that. Well, he does care when for he, her, when, or, or, yeah. or like like it had something to do with when he saved when he saved her from those two guys who so, to attack her and said they'd be gentle. You know those guys. Oh there's, right, yeah. There's also a scene, and I don't know if you you hit if you hit it or you miss it because there's this, uh, there's another cutscene with where you hear Noz- Nozomi crying in the park, mm-hmm. and he goes and sit down with her on a bench, basically too. It, it could be missed, I believe. It's a possible missable scene too, but like it's, yeah, he cares for her, but from my understanding too, it's also that like he's at a stubborn point in his life, and he also I think doesn't want other people around him to get hurt. That's like it's his. Yeah. mission basically yeah. so yeah so that mm-hmm. was the point was you know i, I kind of gave him the benefit of the doubt right his father's just been killed sure he's got other things going on yeah. this is a friend of his maybe he's maybe he's trying to protect her maybe he's trying to distance himself and stuff like that so i um, I, I felt uh like a sister vibe like a, like a protecting of a, of a sister more of a sibling type of vibe out of it i didn't feel that much like i don't know like i guess i guess because rio came off as cold and I felt that there was more of like an overlooking, you know, uh, father figure or parent or like brother. Uh, that's how I felt from it. Like, like even he didn't want real, didn't want help from even his aunt or from his, uh, his cousin, I believe uh, yeah, he didn't want any of the, any help from that. So he just wanted to, you know, take this burden and go. He just wanted to get to land deep. I, I like the sub story though about the girl who's really interested in this guy who uh you know she's like dropping him subtle hints constantly like hey uh missed you at class or hey uh you know I'm interested in this stuff and then all of a sudden she's had enough of it she's had enough of the games and she's like listen I'm going to Canada <laughs> put a ring on it yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, this this girl's story is even better than the forklift game. So there's a moment with her where you have to have your picture taken with her. <laughs> this moment on stream, it was I was so upset in this moment because to this point, I had may, and maybe it's just me projecting, but I had projected myself onto Rio and said, This is my this is my girlfriend interactions that to me seem to be more than just platonic friendship or and maybe that's because i've been out of the game for too long or whatever that's not the point the point being that you end up having a picture taken with nozomi actually two pictures and the photographer then has you pick which picture to keep i understood this as you would both keep this picture However, it became that I kept the good picture and then she got the lousy one. And I felt like a total asshole in that moment. And I did not like it. (laughs) I knew, I knew a second you took the good one. I'm like, Oh, musty just, you know, gave, gave his girlfriend the bad picture, you know, you know, granted this isn't uh, a feature that carries over to the other games basically, or something that would affect like said relationship. Like if you give her the bad picture, you're saying, we're not, we're not in a relationship, basically. It's not like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if it would be a moment where that changes the story, basically, like a mass effect. There's, like, no, bra- there's no branching paths based on this yeah. picture. That's, yeah. that's good to know. Yeah. But in the moment, I was just like, wow, I basically just gave her a picture of the two of us standing at the absolute furthest apart we could and still be in this picture with each other. It just felt but- horrible. Yeah, but it yeah. actually is the best thing that you could do because what she wants is for you to take the picture of both of you together because she's like, oh, that's how he wants to remember us, right? It's yeah. actually a with good sign. On, with her head on you know, his shoulder and everything. and Probably the one good sign Shenmue gave her the entire time. It's funny how you call it him Shenmue. <laughs> <laughs> what Why? is the Shenmue, actually? Let's, let's that. Is that. Shenmue? 
<laughs> Nobody else was Shenmue. <laughs> no spoilers, though. No spoilers from the second game. So, yeah, do they ever explain what Shenmue was? Because it was never mentioned once in the in the whole game. It's mentioned in the second game. It's it's actually um, a tree. And it's, uh, I believe it's kind of seen as like like a religious tree kind of or something like that. So, but what's the, with the spoilers? Jeez, we're all going to play the second game now <laughs> after that harrowing cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's, it's, it's essentially like, I don't think the overall thing is Shenmue. I think it's the tree is supposed to be like a symbol. Cause it's a godlike tree or something like that. So it's, and I think essentially the story branches, branches off, off of uh, that. All right. Although it's, it, it is interesting because some of the like branding on some of the products that you can buy actually say Shenmue on them. So it's like that, that like, was changed for the HD release, though. Was that OK? Yeah. So there's, there's that actually because they couldn't get licenses that they had at that point. Do you think? Yeah, they're... they had okay. Coca-Cola as a license. They had Timex as a license. They they had a few brands and they didn't want to pay for that for the re-release of it. Yeah, Because the re-release, the watch was a Sega watch, right? Mm-hmm. Sega chocolate, Shenmue chips, you know. <laughs> really? I didn't know that. I, well, obviously, I didn't play the HD remaster. I didn't know they changed the branding and all that. That's what yeah. I mean. So what did they do it for the cola? Smaller budget. Uh, it was called like Jet Cola or something, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, I thought it was called Jet in the Dreamcast version, too. Are you sure? May- it no. maybe, maybe it's in the Japanese release, but I'm pretty sure Coca-Cola is a is one of the brands that is, it's in that game. So It could be. The world will never know. But yeah, so we, we, we spent a fair amount trying to, trying to deconstruct Rio as, as an individual. One, one comment I want to make, and we can, this can actually bring us, into, bring us into some of the other stuff that happens. We could do a deep dive on the story, but I, honestly, the, I will say there's both a lot and not a lot to the story. Uh, in the grand scheme of this, what, what I assume is going to be more than a three-part story, in fact, I think Ryan, you said it was going to be a nine-part story in the beginning. I've heard so many different things over the years. I heard at one point it was supposed to be a fourteen-chapter thing, and then I heard it was supposed to be nine, and then whatever. And essentially, the first game is just chapter one, and then I think I come... think I think you could even argue that this is the prologue. It could be. Well, it depends how long how how long he actually wants to go with it. Um, yeah. I think they come to real came to realize that 14 games or 10, 12 games, whatever they they decided it was going to be to tell the story was going to be too many games to tell, you know, a story. So the second chapter is kind of a part that is, was originally re- released in a comic book that I, I believe is unlockable on the HD release. And it's on the disc that comes with the Xbox release. It explains kind of um, the trip between Japan to Hong Kong, what happens to the lead character. And essentially the second game then is chapters three, four, and five. At this point, I don't know what chapter or Shinmu 3 will be, but I believe Yu Suzuki's already come on and said that Shinmu 3 will not be the final game in the series. There's gonna be at least one more game before the story wraps up. So what I wanted to make, I want to make one more comment about Ryo and then we can we can continue on. And Mike, you had you had sort of alluded to the fact that he's on this mission, right? He's just seen his father smacked down to some extent uh, in front of him and has also been incapacitated by this man in green silk. And the thing that I have a hard time with, I get the vengeance thing. I get the vengeance angle. There's, there's two things that frustrate me about Rio. The last thing that his father says to him is keep your friends uh, and the ones that you love close to you. And Rio, through this game, pushes <laughs> everyone away. Every yeah. single person pushes them away. Now, if this is part one of a multi-part arc, okay, I'll I I, I will I will maybe hand wave that. But to me, it feels like wow, you are not only defying what your father told you, but you are making this harder on yourself when you're trying to grieve and not giving yourself a whole lot of time. Like he gives himself like two days before he's like, got to find him, got to find him. And and I realized that if he waits, then the trail may go cold. However, over the span of the month of December, there's nothing but distraction. And 
Ryo being on this mission to go find this man, I find it out of character to stop at an arcade and play a glorified Space punching game or Space Harrier or hang on, right? Like to me, well, that those... was your choice. Well, that's sure, it, it you, was my that's choice. How, that's how you were grieving. And you chose those actions from Shenmue that. himself. <laughs> from Shenmue himself. <laughs> The thing that I, I like, there were moments where it's like, you have 12 hours to kill. And to me, it's like, what else am I going to do? Like the one thing that I can do to keep myself occupied during this stretch of time is that arcade. Oh, uh, you forgot least... putting down the controller and making lunch. <laughs> See, that, that doesn't does make it. for that doesn't make for a riveting stream, Miles. I could do it. I'll switch the category and everything. But no, that 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 was uh, not in the game plan there. I don't know. I I just find it kind of counter to what his mission is to... At one point, he needs money. This whole time, he's been thrown into a gashapon machine and getting capsule toys out of it, right? Like, there's some very... The, this, this man, being 18, still has so much... And, Maybe I just unlock this new layer to this character that I hadn't realized. But maybe he's having such a hard time abandoning his childhood to go and be the man that avenges his father's death. I don't know. You, maybe that's Dr. what it is. Freud. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what's happening is he's, he's having this, this conflict here. And all he wants to do is punch, 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 boom, boom. You know, that kind of stuff. Or play darts, which I don't think I ever did. I think I skipped darts. Oh no, I, I played darts once. I played darts the most out of any game, and I was did addicted really? to the darts. Yeah. So did you did you guys enjoy that? Like, now that I've now that I have have given my two cents on the whole arcade experience, what did you think about the fact that there was this full arcade experience built into this game? Eric, I want to start with you. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to I wanted to talk about that because one of the things about this game, of course, is they had set up this entire real-time system, right, where they were going to have the NPCs have actual schedules, move around in real time, and do all this stuff. And so in order to do something like that, you have to, or you mentioned events that are going to occur at certain points, you have to provide something in the game world that allows uh, you as the, the player to let time run, you know, let time go forward as the game itself, as the main storyline of the game isn't going through. And so I think this was actually a very clever uh, solution to a, a, an important practical problem that they had, which was they wanted to make sure that the player had something to do while they were waiting for these real-time things to occur. And why not just throw in things that would be real or that would occur that would exist in, an, in, a, in a Japanese uh, village or a town like that. And so they threw in a game center and it was kind of a, it was kind of nice because you could play games. Presumably, if you're playing Shenmue, you're a video gamer, so why not throw an arcade in there, play some old Sega games? I liked the uh, the fan service. And then they had some other things like collectibles to the toys you mentioned. Um, those are things that appeal to certain other kinds of gamers that you know they might want to try to collect some things. I went for it. I tried to get some of the things, uh, the cassette ta uh, cassette tapes for the, the music. So I thought it was kind of clever. I, I thought it was a an interesting way to solve a practical problem of the game in a way that made sense in the game world. And yeah, it kind of, it kind of, you know, I, I mentioned the Penny Arcade comic, you know, where they make fun of it. Where he's like, I'm, I'm Ryu Hazuki and I'm going to avenge my father right after I play with this kitten and drink this Coke and buy these toys. So it's kind of ridiculous, but I imagine even in the real world, you wouldn't necessarily be spending 24 or seven uh, avenging your father you 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 might have some downtime so i didn't think too much of it i thought it was a, a, a something that they uh, a real a thing they really need to do to uh, address the practical structure of the game did you have a go-to in that in that arcade you know, for those like time absorbers did you have well, one thing overall that that you preferred of course i mean i i i'm a big fan of the old sega space Harrier game and uh, i often went to that and I tried to tried to do a little beat. I even tried. We tried to do a beat my score of the uh, Space Area game within Shenmue. But uh, I only did that maybe in the beginning or first half of the game. I, I'd play Space Area. I enjoyed Hang On, and I did the QTE. 
things I never did were uh, I did do the arcade. I never did the. Uh, wasn't there a Mahong parlor or a gambling parlor or something? I never. There is. I never there, did that one. There is in the bar district. Was that like downstairs? No, it's where that lady. Remember, you were trying to talk to her. Oh, uh, hot Linda or something. Yeah. What was her name? That's, or that's the building I believe she's right in front of. I like, I think to entice people to come in and gamble. So, see, I walk in there and then they're just like, "You can't be in here. Your droids." <laughs> no. Mike, did you did you have a a, a go to for like a, a time occupier? Did you did you like having some intentional distractions within this game? Well, when I first played it, yeah, like, you know, I would collect, uh, you know, the cassettes or the little things from the vending machines or Space Harrier Darts was the shaky hand. I used to play those a lot, but like when I played it this uh, recently, because there's no, you know, fast travel. So you, to get to certain story parts, you have to wait. So most of the time I just stood around and waited. <laughs> I just waited till the next QTE or the next. Uh, you know, walk this, down this alley at a certain time or or whatever. I just powered through it. But when I first played it, yes, you know, I was wasting so much time. Uh, you know, you get all this allowance from your aunt and I'm just spending it on nonsense. And then it's like, oh, by the way, you're out of money. And it's like, okay, but I, I need to buy it. I need to go on a ship. I have to buy it. So I wasted all that money frivolously thinking that, okay, you know, you have all this money. You can do whatever you want with it. Meanwhile, you still need to save up anyways. But like, other games, uh, back to like, you know, the, the fact that, you know, it does take you out of the element, you know, real uh, wasting time and going to arcades. And, you know, his main purpose is to, you know, avenge his father's death. And you're, you know, you're put to waste time, you know, on an arcade, which is like you're saying is kind of out of the element. But that same thing could be said about GTA and people love that, right? You were killing, yeah. killing people and going to play darts. Uh, you're killing people and going to play pool. So, that you know time waster was in Shenmue and it's still got adopted in modern day but nobody really everybody sees the you know the linear story of this game as opposed to the grand scope of a GTA and focused mainly on what you're doing and why am I doing it like you said like you said that uh that I guess that dork lease the comic strip where you were saying or Eric was saying where, you know, oh, I go feed a cat, or, oh, I'm going to go do that. Well, in GTA, it's, you know, groundbreaking. But in Shenmue, when they actually were groundbreaking, it was mm -hmm. frowned upon, right? So it's, like, uh, it's 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 different. Like, different folks, uh, strokes for different folks, right? So for me, I was, I didn't care. Like, it didn't take me out of the element because I knew I had to waste time. It's either me standing around like I did or me going to the arcade. Because I if sure. I go back home, there's nothing for me to do there. So might as well kill the time to get, you know, progress your, your story or your, your character. Yeah. Cause really, I mean, back at the house, once you've rifled through all the drawers, uh, nothing. that's about, that's about it. Um, I'm going to correct you there. There is something to do, but you have to unlock it in the game. And that is, there is a Sega Saturn underneath your television in the game. Now, I, I've known about the Sega Saturn since way back in the day. The thing is, I didn't know it was actually playable until this time around. So in those tomato shops, the convenience stores where you can buy cassette tapes or batteries mm -hmm. or light bulbs, there's also, if you buy a bag of chips or chocolate or caramel, you get a raffle ticket. And if you draw the number two in either tomato shop, either at the dock or in Dobuita, you can win either uh, Space Harrier or Hang On. And you can then take those those two games and play them at your house. I didn't know that. Yeah, is that is that even that's on the original Dreamcast version? It's too? on the original yeah, Dreamcast. Yeah, one. Yeah. I, did, I didn't know about that until this time around. So because I've I've always it generally avoided the the raffle thing. I just I never I never ever ever done it basically. And also I realized I'm like, hey, I got in three number one, so I won the boom box three times, which is the number one prize. And wow. I couldn't, I, and I got all the little figures for number four and three. I couldn't draw number two. I eventually ran out of time with days working. So I, I missed out my opportunity. If I'd known that sooner, I probably would have pursued it earlier in the game. But, you know, whatevs. That's interesting. Yeah, because you guys were making such a big deal about the raffle there. And I was, I was like, it's just a thing just a collectible like i do it like what is what does this do for me you didn't say that there was an actual so there are full saturn games built into this there are what you're saying yeah they're the, they're the same games as you can get in the arcade you can either win space area 
which I won. Sorry, Ryan. I, I actually won the Saturn version of Space Harry. Or Hang On. And Hang On, right? <clears throat> and there's also cassettes. I actually won, I think, uh, the third prize, Ryan, or fourth, are uh, cassettes, and I won a uh, Hang On uh, cassette. Oh, yes. Soundtracks for the game. You're correct. Soundtrack. You can also play them in Tom's boombox by his uh, by his hot dog stand if you want. We should talk about Tom for a minute. Tom is the character in this that that had a level of emotion that I really enjoyed, although it was it was extremely goofy. Miles, did you have an opinion on Tom? No, not a fan I of don't, Tom. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> although I was surprised he taught me my last move. Yeah. Like okay. It, it, it would have been more interesting had it been more like unless he was like like why does he know a tornado kick is it from like the secret like hot dog convention or something like where did he pick that up or he's from the states right correct where he didn't sound like it <laughs> <laughs> he had that jamaican accent i know it sounds like he's from jamaica but uh it's from queens <laughs> You know, it, it, you know I, I don't know where he is, you know, where he's from. It, it doesn't really quite say where he is, just that he's going back to the States at the end. But Tom's hot dog stand, that actually it was a hot dog stand. Ba- uh, it was based off of, in Dubuida, a hot dog stand on that street. And like I said, it was, up until recently, it's been there since like 1986. It, it was there for, <laughs> no, I can't say Tom was there selling it, but there was definitely a hot dog stand that it was inspired in Shenmue. See, that's interesting. So so through Tom, through some of the other characters, Rio learns uh, throughout the story, throughout the course of the story, even up until the moment before the final boss, you are learning moves. And sometimes those are a struggle to really uh, get to work. Sometimes. That, that's but, that's uh, kind, of, kind of the game's fault, at least a little bit. They, they tell you, but they don't show you, show you. if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. They uh they say take a step back like they'll say yeah. oh like start by leaning back so you have to assume you're, you're hitting back on here, but they don't tell you like you can't press start and see what you're supposed to put for the input you can't you know it's not start plus X and A or you know they, you just gotta like, kind of listen to what they say and then do it and that's something that still kind of carries over to Shenmue too where you can't really advance you know until you master that move and one thing I do like about that is I like that you can strengthen your moves and you level them up. I, I, I think that was really neat on the, on the part of the game's part. That Granted, it's, the, the moves you know are generally pretty stronger prior to it, but the ones you learn are weaker. So as another time killer here, and I don't want to backtrack too much here, one of the other things you can do to kill time in the game is go to an alley or an empty warehouse and constantly do the moves over and over and over again to strengthen the moves. Ah, grinding. A little bit. Perfect. More entertaining. <laughs> I I will say I appreciated the fact that they didn't just go A and X or, you know, like like that they masked that with the way that a teacher would teach. My issue is the one move in particular, which is the move that you get taught way at the end. I had a really hard time pulling that move off once. And they're coaching was horrible trying to tell me oh you that that step is unnecessary and it's like you told me to step backwards like what are you talking about unnecessary or you have no power in your arms it's like well i'm pushing the i'm pushing the arm button i found that really frustrating and they at one point they asked me if i was tired same here I, i was having a hard time with that that one as well that that's one of those ones where I really wish there would have been some kind of button layout. Just like there's quick time events of the game. Kind of give me like <laughs> something to do like that so I know what I'm doing. And like, like I said, actually actually run the combat through a quick time, like like a training quick time event. That yeah, something I like that. Don't mind that. So then I learn it from going forward. That that there's like little things like you said that carries over a little bit. It happened at least to me a couple times with Shenmue too, where. I, I hear you what you're saying, but I don't think I'm doing it. You know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm hitting the buttons correctly to what you're saying. And I, I think also that homeless guy in the first game, he teaches you a move and I couldn't figure it out for, it took me quite a while to figure it out. 
what he was doing. And then when I did it, I was like, oh, it was the other button that I was not pressing. That's the main reason why I'm not doing the move correctly. So I I feel like the, oh, go ahead, Eric. I was going to make a quick comment on the Dreamcast version. Um, They use the VMU a little bit there. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, when you get a partial sequence of the move correctly, the VMU will beep. It will show you what you did that was correct. And I, I seem to recall building up, maybe it was only the moves towards the end where it was a combination of things, but you kind of, as you did certain parts of it correctly, the VMU would give you a, a beep to give you a an affirmative that you, you, uh, you're you doing it the right way. That does sound familiar. I think some of the pacing of the special moves were problematic to me. Like, I feel like they start teach till much later than they needed to, or... I missed. I may have missed some along the way, maybe, because it, like it was all of a sudden uh, I get to the docks and then people are willing to start teaching me things. You know, yeah, I gotta agree with you, man. Like when I when I started, I just came off God Hand, so I'm expecting I'm gonna beat up a bunch of dudes constantly. I'm gonna be spanking people. This is gonna be great. And I start Shenmue and I realize there's no fights. There's like no fights. And I I immediately bought one of these expensive scrolls at the fortune teller. And I was like, where are them fights? I get in one fight and I'm like, oh, there's no fights. Until you get to the docks, that's where all the fights happen. So I'm actually glad there wasn't more emphasis put on the fighting in the beginning of the game. Because honestly, you don't need it. You're just finding out who ran over that cat. (laughs) And then you're uh, chasing after discount Gollum, right? (laughs) So you know there were I think I think some of the fights might be might there might be some optional fights and I have the prima strategy guide that Ryan has and one of the what I think I will claim one of the maybe frustrating but simultaneously you know very interesting things about this game is that there's a there's a path through the game right but because everything is based on time and where you are and where when you're there certain things can happen it's possible to miss these things. There, there was a move that you could learn from a guy in a park uh, early on in the game, uh, and there was a fight that I missed, and uh, I just had to move forward and say, "Hey, you know what? I'm, you're not going to hit everything in this game the first playthrough, or even even the tenth playthrough, maybe." There was a couple of thugs, and I think you hit this, Musty. Uh, there were a couple of thugs when you're walking by the tomato convenience store that they come out of the alley or something, and they 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 mess with you. I didn't get that at all because I wasn't there. I didn't pass through that that section at the right time. The timing wasn't there. Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's some optional things that you, you may have missed, some fights included. But uh, but considering that this was supposed to be a virtual fighter RPG, at least one of its initial uh, motivations, right, Musty, you mentioned that there there truly isn't a lot of fighting in the game. Yeah, I I, I think the lack of fighting was is what demotivated me from training more. I think I think if if I had felt like it, and to be honest, I got by without having to be really good at it, which is either accessibility or they didn't want to be too hard on on the player at that point. Uh, there was a fight against a bunch of sailors in the same lot that you can train in, and that one really it was just a matter of kiting them around getting one of them at a time and then using whatever one move you felt really comfortable which was either punching or kicking or jumping and kicking or grabbing and then punching them right in the stomach one good time the quick time events though those those i found to be interesting they felt like some of them felt like die hard arcade some some stretches of uh, of of that game, which I, I make sense. Another, that was another Sega game, yeah. Other you know, and so some of that was there, and it was the you know, dodge to the left, jump over this, uh, you know, dodge to the don't run over, you know, watch out for Tom, dodge this car, this biker, all that kind of stuff. But games weren't doing that at this point, and like like you said, Mike, there's some there's some. The, some pioneering happening here that then carried over into other stuff for other systems or other stuff beyond just this entry for Sega. QTEs are commonplace now. And this was one of the first games that was doing that. So I amended. I, I did enjoy some of the QTE moments. I will say that. But the combat just felt like it felt like a throwaway to me until later when all of a sudden they're like, hey, there's 70 guys. <laughs> Do it. That and 
and the first 68 of them for the most part are just like one good punch and they're down or at least i found one move that i could just hit them one time and it would take most of them out the the other aspect miles you brought this up when you were talking about your overall thoughts about this forklifting you know what's so funny is that I had no idea there was forklifting in this game when I started. And like, that should be on the cover. It should just be a picture of a forklift. <laughs> but the thing is, my favorite mini game in games is forklift games. Me I too. love picking Me too. things up and dropping them off places. In Help Wanted, I play the forklift game constantly. That's the only thing I'm interested in. In uh, Misadventures of Tron Bon, I really like the Moving the Crates game. Like, as soon as I saw that, I was like, yes, sign me up for some of this. So uh, I just remember the, the map for the once you get in the forklift, the map for the dock, maybe after two days, gets pretty familiar. And you can kind of like, know, oh, this is the area with one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, this is the area with eight. This is the area with 14. And you get kind of familiar with the 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 way that the map looks, and you're just zooming by people. If they don't get out of your way, just keep running into them until they disappear. Just keep going. But I will say, I never came in first in the forklift race as much yeah. as I wanted it. They always say that if you want it more than the other guys, you'll get it. But you know what? I don't think this AI needed it that badly. I think they get it all the time. I wanted it more. I still didn't win it. Whatever. Not that I'm sore about it. Just I hope there's more forklifts in the second game. You have to really string together almost a perfect run. I got clipped by the third place guy, and that and and I could not catch up. I, I still managed to get into second, but like at one point I got the road. Uh, another point, like I think I, I I don't know. I was very very frustrated by that. I liked it. The forklift controls better than anything else in this game. I'm just you know what you probably weren't doing. Do, you know, after I got frustrated, I put my blades up, my forklift up. Now we're playing for keeps, trying to run into their heads. Didn't work. That didn't work either. <laughs> That's yeah. Oh, I'm the only one who finished. Oh, wild how that happens. So the trick to to winning the race, and it's not the easiest. Thing I want to do. tricks. I want strategy. The, well, the strategy to win is to a if you're going to be close to get with somebody, don't let them go in front of you. Back off for a second. Let them go in front of you because if, if you bump, you're going to bump into a wall and then you're going to fall behind. So the key is if you're getting close to a race and you're near somebody and you're going to make a turn, just let them go first because you'll catch up to them. You have better like acceleration than they do. After that, and you always want to hit the inside of that bar towards the last turn at the end. You want to hit the inside of the docks kind of and the, like that you'll cut off three seconds of your race by doing that so if you hit the inside cut lane that's your best chances of winning that race is See, don't bump in anybody and hit that cut. Enough. so well my experience in games is get the inside corner and make them avoid you and that obviously does not apply in this situation you know, and if I had played it as if this was my own actual forklift and I had to do my work in this thing afterwards, I probably would have not tried to uh, wreck it in the process. So I, I, I was alluding to the thing earlier that, that I, I really liked and really once the, the forklift part was was a bright spot for me, although it seems so mundane. And uh, but it was it was actually completing a like I think there was one day I actually finished the quota like or not just finish the quota every box had moved and then i was doing really well until i got caught up with some some mad angels and that was kind of frustrating now eric i know you have a story about forklifting that i want to open the floor for you on sure yeah um i actually got stuck in one of the uh one of the job days and if you remember the structure of the game, uh, when you're, you're at the end of the game, you're driving these forklifts around at your job and events will trigger um, as you go about your daily routine. What they do is they give you a map and I had inadvertently followed the alternative path on the map, which resulted in me never triggering the event. And so I was going around through the same day over and over again. And I'm like, OK, so these mad angels are supposed to attack me at between 3.30 and 4.30 p.m., when I've got this uh, 
when I've got this item on my forklift, this crate on my forklift, and I'm approaching the, the warehouse, and it never happened. And I went through this a couple of times. And I'm like, what am I what am I doing wrong? And it turns out it was because I was following this alternative path. It was apparently the longer path. And Melissa told me, she said, why don't you go the other way? And I'm like, well, I kind of been doing it this way out of habit now. It was I started it when I wasn't as familiar with the uh, with the dock area. So I just kind of out of habit kept going the same wrong way. And I ended up looking it up online. And apparently this is a known trip point in the game where if you take this one path, you can get stuck. And some people are offering that or explaining that, well, it's a way that you can prolong the game. If you want to um, not progress the game, it allows you to make a lot of money and do a bunch of things. But but uh, I hit this thing quite accidentally. And then, and Musty, I went back and watched your uh, your stream of it, and you uh, you happened to go the right way first time out. Yeah, and I think I, I always followed the solid line on that. Like I, I saw that there were some that had the sort of secondary line, and for some reason I just – the first one only had one route, and so I got used to following that line. So I, I think that's I think that's why I did it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I, interesting. Now the interesting. thing is, though, it's not like you can't go to work, though. So like, how how many attempts at the you know you your normal run would have five forklift race attempts? How many forklift races did you do? Oh, I probably ended up doing anywhere from eight to 10. I forget the exact number okay. because I kept redoing that same day. And so I did actually, you know, um, if you'll pardon my saying, so I did actually get first place. Uh, once I figured out that you could redo that day over and over again, I practiced it and I, I, or I reloaded a save or something and I finally got first place. And then I went ahead and then I tried to get all of the forklifts and I eventually did get all the forklift toys. That was just something that was, uh, was fun to do, but legitimately i probably did about eight eight to ten days at the uh, dock uh and that's excluding when i just reloaded the save and, and tried again it probably took me about it probably took me about a dozen or more tries to get uh to get all the forklift races i probably did about a dozen times that's that such is... an eric that's such an eric problem to have i just want to say like i'm already going the long way i mean i know this route i'm just gonna keep taking this yeah. route. Oh, man. You could still be playing the Shenmue right now yeah. if it wasn't for that walkthrough. I had to look it up. I had to. I had to cheat and say, "What? What? What am I doing wrong here? Why isn't this thing triggering?" And that was. Did why. the date? Did the date continue to? Yeah. Progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It. It was interesting because I, my first clue huh. was, was something that should have clued me in was the date kept progressing. He kept telling me to go to the same warehouse, and I'm like, okay, that's weird because. The first day or two, it changed, and then the conversations I had with the guy at uh, when you had lunch, uh, your work lunch, you'd all be sitting on like a bench with Mark and the other guys you were working with, and I would talk to one of them, and he would always say, "Hey, thanks for helping out Mark yesterday." And I'm like, "Well, it wasn't yesterday; it was like four days ago now." So I just figured it was a glitch <laughs> in the game or whatever. But it turns out because the game was still thinking I was on, you know, day two of the. Uh, of the job, but the calendar date kept progressing. So there was kind of, I weird... wonder, I wonder if there is a, an end to that loop. Like how, how far into the future can you go with Shenmue? April like, 15th. Could... So this game does have both Shenmue's have a bad ending, but if you don't pr beat this game by, I April really 15th, wish Eric would have gotten the bad ending. <laughs> if, if yeah. you don't... So tell me, tell me about it. If you if you don't beat it by April fifteenth, Landy comes back to your house and he kills you. We'll just slightly backtrack here. He he kills your father in the beginning, thinking you have one of the mirrors. He gives him a bogus mirror, and you end up finding the correct mirror that Landy was looking for. Well, in the bad ending, he says he found out that you have the mirror he's looking for, and he basically gives you the touch of death and you die. So. That's 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 of uh, Eric didn't beat it by April fifteenth. That was going to be his faith, you know. His I mean, faith. that's a lot of repetition there, but that's wild. Like that, it's a Bill Murray Groundhog Day, kind of. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I, I, that's absolutely what it is. But that is that is really interesting. That he's like, I'm tired of waiting for you over in Hong Kong, so I'm going to come back <laughs> and I'm going to just do it like did you get a raise <laughs> every day 
Eric I think on the days that I repeated, I did get a raise. I, I eventually made it up to six hundred dollars, six hundred yen a crate. And then Here comes then the money. <laughs> <laughs> I think those That's days did count for raises. Uh, the 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 ones that were sort of in when I was stuck in that loop. Yeah. Wow. Eric became the dock owner. <laughs> That's right. He runs. He runs the whole thing. Terry, move over. Mighty Q Dog now runs the Mad Angels. Mighty Q Dog, it's not. Yeah, it's no longer the Mad Angels. It's the Mighty Q Dogs running the running the harbor. That's that is wild. Were Were there other moments throughout this that you individually found interesting or profound or something that stuck with you that you wanted to talk about? Did uh, Mike? Did you have like a favorite moment from the story that maybe we haven't addressed or something that that resonated with you? Uh, there was a lot of uh, like weird moments, like Goro obviously being like one of the weirdest characters in there. Uh, like I understand the hot dog stand uh, was, you know, him dancing around and acting all weird. But Goro just that uh, every time he walked on screen, you heard the music as he's walking. And then you find out that he was uh going to date somebody who was uh, younger than him. And then, but they also say that they, 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 they tell you, it's like, Oh, it's okay. Only it, it, over here. It's like, wait a minute. That's not, that's kind of weird. Like I wasn't even asking, but the fact that they just made that say, okay, she's, she's younger than me, but it, that's okay over here. Yeah. They say, they say like, she's only 16. He's like, that's legal in Japan, man. That's legal here. That, that threw me for a loop. I'm like, why is that even a thing? Like, you could have made her any age or you could have made Goro the same age or, or whatever. And it was just like, that's legal here, dude. And say, like, all right. It's like the writer's trying to brace himself for something that's about <laughs> for a lawsuit. <laughs> so yeah, this game that. was really forward thinking then yeah, in 1999. It, it, it was <laughs> so funny. Like it could have, that, that like stuck with me. I'm like, why is that a, a, like a focal point? Like, why is that all in my face? But yeah, like uh, I found that pretty interesting. The fact, like you said, you didn't get a chance to really get to, to know Nizumi very well. Like, it, it's just, they like said, it, it felt like there was something supposed to be there, but never really led you that, that direct path. Like, I, I found, like, like you said, you felt like it was a neglecting boyfriend to a girlfriend. To me, I felt like it was more of a, a brother-sister type thing, but there was kind of weird vibes that kind of led, like, you know the pictures do you want to be close do you want to be far okay so you know if i if i chose close does that mean i don't like her or vice versa like so you don't know what's really going on in her head like it's, it's an, she's, she's an npc yeah. so it, you don't really get to know her as a character so you're just basically playing your story but not really affecting or knowing what your effect is on other people's story because you know games of you know this nature that are open world every action has a constant reaction so this game never really gave you that it just gave you your reaction and i don't really care about anybody else and like i said it is based off of you know your vengeful plight to go after land d but it seemed like there was still more to it that needed to be done the the the, um, the fact that there was a giant budget in this game and the fact that there was very poor voice acting uh was unbelievable like the, the you know 90 million dollars which was unheard of for uh, you know that time in a in a uh, an open world type of game or in any type of game and it seemed like the voice acting was you know even though it was ported over or subbed or dubbed from the japanese it just seemed like there was still so if you're planning on bringing it over there was still so much better or a lot better voice acting that could have been done in, in in that type of uh of, of a game that of that immense you know dialogue that's happening mm -hmm. at all points in the, every alley yeah now ryan you you had some comments you were telling me earlier this month that some of that was by design um can you elaborate on that so i remember this goes back to here i hear, heard this a few years ago when they announced shenmue 3 back in 2015 there's this podcast done by Sega nerds and they pull the, the English voice cast along to do the show and they talk about it. And one of the things is because they gets brought up on that show, but the, the cast goes on to talk about that. They're not bad voice actors. It was told to them to deliver it that way. They, they said, you know, we can, we can Americanize this 
talk say how it is for the american audience or north american audience we can deliver it that way and they said no this game is essentially we wanted to have a japanese feel and this is how japanese people talk granted it's being dubbed from japanese to english so it's not properly probably translated but it's it's supposed to be the the delivery was like that on purpose because we i would say north americans i should say we talk a certain way and i guess that's just not i guess common for how they talk in japan it's i know i i completely understand the poor voice acting but but it, but it sounds like they were guided to yeah put it in that way i i could see that i um i also want to say quick since we're talking about the voice acting i love it absolutely love it love it i, I can't get enough of it i um when I played the sequel, I played it on the Dreamcast, and um, it was it was a burned copy of the UK release. And in the UK release, they didn't have the voice acting; it was just translated. So you get the Japanese voice acting with the English subtext below. And to me, it, it was missing that. Like I I kind of need that voice acting in the game. It's to me, it's part of the game that. It's fantastic and awful at the same time, but I love. I mean, it. is that is some of that going back to like sixties and seventies Japanese cinema, like that just has that tone, eighties too, I suppose. I, I have I haven't watched much myself, but kung, kung fu flicks, for example, sure, right? I mean, like some of those have What's a very Hong Kong, Hong Kong based? cinema. Yeah, I think I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. But... Yeah, I mean, there's a very there's a specific kind of cadence and things like that um i just wish there was a little variety in the like to to kind of give one more one more comment from me on voice acting like i just wish there was a little more variety in the way questions were answered and asked don't just give me the same answer from everybody give me breadcrumbs from a bunch of different people that kind of all culminate in one answer so one of the very first uh, big games I played that had voiceover everywhere, and I remember this was a big deal, was Final Fantasy X. Mm -hmm. Final Fantasy X was the first, if I'm not mistaken, the first Final Fantasy game that used voices throughout the game. And Shenmue predates that by at least a year, uh, I think two years even. Yes. Um, so I think I'm not, I, I, I guess maybe I'm defending the game too much, but... Uh, I think it's 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 valuable to remember. I don't remember there being any games uh, much earlier than this that did attempted an entire game with with uh, with voice. Up until that point, most of them had been text, and so I don't know. I, I yeah, guess what there I'm there saying. were some. I mean, there's some examples of PlayStation games like um, Symphony of the Night that had voice moments, sure, but right? Not, but not to this degree. Right? Not the entirety of the game. Yeah, I mean, like I can't imagine how much space on the disc that the audio would take up in that in, at that time um, even the the varied paths that you're saying you know uh, the, the one of the first ones uh, first games at least console games i'm not a pc person that had you know branching stories or you know depending on the question you're asking was like uh kotor uh, knights of the old republic where you're you're asking a certain question and there was various selections of mm -hmm. what to choose and that didn't come out till god what 2001 uh probably even later probably 2003 I, I don't even know and you know again this predates that so again this is you know with the 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 space of the gd rom that these things had they're they're, they're very limited to what they could and couldn't do i guess so like there i'm sure there was so much on the cutting room floor that sega or yu suzuki didn't you know couldn't fit in or or whatever there was you know time constraints or whatever uh but something like branching story i like i totally agree i would love to have seen you know like trying to piece that notebook together but by actually asking the right question uh by prompt right mm -hmm. um, like make it a conversation instead of just a q a yeah thing. yeah i think i think that this game if it had come out within the last seven years, instead of 20 years ago, this game would have made a great Telltale game. I'll, I'll but, stand by that comment. 
But I, I don't think Telltale would exist if Shenmue didn't come out. Like, you got to keep in fair. mind, this is like the first one of its kind. And those added conversations when you're walking by, that was just like somebody adding something to the mechanic that Shenmue already created. It's good for its time. We can see it now, what they did, right? Mm -hmm. The director's in that room going, can uh, Shenmue just say, I see? Can he just say, I see, to end this conversation? He can? Well, then we'll cut out the other thing because we can just use the same voice you know the same line again and again and again mm -hmm. but you know at the time that was that was some hot stuff man i'm sure it was well and i know ryan ryan you said that a lot of uh, you said during the month that that you even felt like i was maybe speed running this game uh which was not my intention but that you know taking the time to explore and talk to everyone and fill out that notebook that there were there were pages of that note notebook that I didn't fill in. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why I didn't do that, so I can justify my 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 uh, process here, was that the moment that I got corroborating evidence that I needed to go to the antique the antique store, or I needed to go to warehouse number eight. Like once I got two people to tell me that that's where I needed to go, I stopped asking. Like I didn't feel the need to ask anybody else, and I, and and I think that's where I'm saying if even if the destination is the same, if you find different ways to kind of bring that up, maybe give me. I did. There were some points where you actually had to use the map to kind of get some con contextual clues as to what direction you were going because I didn't know where the where the barber shops were. I wasn't going to go walk into every shop, but I found the map. I looked at the map and it's like, oh, there's one there and there's one there. Or hey, there's this ramen shop up here. Let's go, you know, we'll go to that spot to, you know, ask about, I think we were asking about Chinese people at that point. But I, I, I acknowledge that, yes, I probably didn't do the level of exploration that I could have. Once I had a destination figured out, I wasn't going to waste my time to, to get there. You know, so think, yeah. that, that's understandable. And that's what, you know, when you just brought up maps there, this is one of the games too that doesn't have like a little sub map or a point to tell you. You have to do like you were saying, basically, you find maps on the streets, basically, it says you are here, opposed to normally at the time you have like your little compass or something like that, or a little sub map on a corner. Now that mm -hmm. becomes little features in the second game. Of, and I know, Mike, you're talking about the optional dialogue boxes. That's also a thing in the second game as well. There's, they made, they made some improvements. To, uh, I think they, uh, they understood some of the mistakes that they did with the first game. I think one of the things that brings it back a little bit to what you're saying, must be about your little bit of frustrations with the game too, is the dialogue with the people. The second game does a much better job where um, you can go up to sit, um, different people and you'll get, better help if you will too um you you don't have to granted this is about the second game you don't have to go around and keep asking everyone like do you know where this shop is they'll say hey i'll take you follow me so you, you'll follow the person there's they, they have better conversation pieces as opposed to asking the same thing over and over again the game kind of speeds you along a little bit faster saying you know what? I'll, I'll show you the way it's on my way so, so they probably got a little bit of feedback and that's yeah. probably what what motivated them there yeah. i think i think it'd be just nice if rio made a point of getting to know some of these people like some of those people on the street i don't know their name I but i'm walking past them every day it's like why not uh have some conversation before just like grabbing someone by the shoulder and being like do you know charlie you know like because that's what i felt like some of that some of his his approach was was just like, and, and then you'd run into the people who were like, I'm not supposed to talk to strangers. And I, I was happy to see something like that. But it's like, he just, he leads with the, he leads with the question and that's it. Like, yeah, I, I just think it would have been interesting if, if there would have been, you, you could even have the answer be the same. I don't, I don't even care about that. Just you're showing a fleshed out world. Let's have, let's, let's apply that personality. But maybe that's, maybe that's what it is. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, I think, I don't know, maybe maybe this isn't what you're getting at, but I think there were, you know, you mentioned the blank pages in the notebook. And that's because I think I determined that that's because there are multiple ways to get the same clues. Right? Okay. So you can, 
uh, one one example that I rarely used was one example was going to the fortune teller, which I thought was kind of neat because again, they kind of built a help system into the game, into the game world, where if you were stuck, you could go to the fortune teller. And in the strategy guide I have, it says, okay, so if you want this entry in your notebook, you got to go to the fortune teller and get this entry. So a bunch of those came from the fortune teller. But um, I went to her once. And, yeah, and it was it was it was the tutorial for the fact that there's a fortune teller. I think. Okay. You can go throughout the game if you're stuck and, and get hints. You can uh, you can get hints about I, I think they're called for the future. They're 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 maybe actually called hints. And I know that there were uh there's a thing at the end. You're under a time pressure. Uh it's one of the first times in the game where there was actual time pressure where you had to do something. And there are multiple ways to figure out who, what it is that you're supposed to do there. So I think you were saying, Musty, that you you know you thought that you know that maybe uh, um, it's not as open world, or it's uh, you know there, there's there's all these people, and and not very many of them are helpful. But there are cases in the game where I think you can go in different directions and get hits, hints from different gotcha. people, and uh, and go that way. And I think the uh, the the blank pages in the and uh, the notebook are evidence that uh, you did skip some of the things, and and that's fine. I think I think that's the way to go. And if I can't, it, it, it might be just that I that I happened upon people who had the right breadcrumb that I didn't need to delve much deeper. Sure, maybe maybe that's what it is. But you 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 had another comment. I was just going to say really quickly. Uh, I don't know if it's going to come up in any other context, but I loved that notebook. I love it when games record in the game. Uh, what's been, kind of been going on in the story, and, and I can flip through. Um, that's especially useful for somebody like me who takes 18 months to finish an RPG, and I don't know what happened in the first half of the game. But I really love that notebook uh, feature. I would flip through that, uh, not often, but occasionally to look back and see how things had progressed. And uh, I wanted to call hey, that a really fantastic feature. Eric, uh, if you could add something in the notebook yourself what would you add because i know that on your channel muddy q dog you do a lot of spreadsheets and stuff i was wondering if you do something like that in shenmue like how many what items i got from the machine or something oh miles miles yes of course it needs a spreadsheet feature absolutely why not have an entry for every i i, I don't know what the word is those little toys I need to know what I paid. I need to know the date I got them. I need to know how many duplicates I got. That's exactly what that game needs is a spreadsheet. So let's hope Shenmue 3 has got a better logging. So the, re the remaster does have it. Uh, there, <laughs> yeah. there is a grid um, yeah. that does show you. That shows you most of them, but for some, apparently there's some glitchiness that is caught. Like at one point I opened up a capsule and just held nothing in my fingers. And I was just like, what, what, what is this? <laughs> uh, and it, it wasn't until I went into that menu that it even gave me the name of what it was, but it still wouldn't show me what the figure is. And yeah, I, weird yeah, kid. which is unfortunate because um, some of those were, were some of the cooler figures, uh, I believe. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's there. If I could add something to the notebook, it would have been a spot for phone numbers separate. Yeah, I found I found myself having to really dig to find the right phone number, and that was in the moment that I needed it. It was frustrating, and then I had to commit it to memory while I typed it in, or I had to write it down. I think I yeah. typed it into the Twitch chat so that I just had it there. Um, did you guys use the phone much? Like, did you ever call like Nozomi or anybody on the phone? Like I tried it a few times and it was stupid. It didn't amount to anything, so I gave up I, after. I called the police to get the achievement. Yeah, for, yeah, for that. And uh, I mean, it, you have an you achievement call... for calling the police. Yep. Yeah. You have to do it before you. I think you start working on the docs, but like you know, if you call it from home, you can call the police, and then you get a, an achievement. It's I think it's supposed to be like report the murder or something like that. I can't remember. I was gonna say, that. what does he do? Because like he, he calls it and he's just like, I shouldn't bother the cops or something like that. And he puts it down or something like that, but then you get your trophy. But you should, man. You yeah. just watched a guy get. You just watched your father get murdered. You're not gonna get some some yeah. some law it's enforcement involved. That's actually what the achievement is. I, I think the achievement is kind of making fun of the game a little bit, right? Because that would be the first obvious thing you would do. And I think the achievement is named something like that, like obvious course of action. Yeah. Call the police, right? So. <laughs> I think the achievement was just for using the phone. Did you try to dial that rotary monster? 
I was like, this is not what it used to be like. It used to be <laughs> fun to use a phone. And this, oh boy, this, something else completely. Well, the game takes place in 86, so I don't know. I think uh, when I was growing up, we had rotary phones in, in 86. I think push button had been invented, but... Uh... That's a rich man's touch, phone. Yeah, that's a rich touch man's tone. Phone. Touch, touch tone. Touch tone yeah. phones. Yes. That, that now that is that is, I guess that's good to know. Uh, that that. At the same time, yeah, I, I I don't feel like I sped through it, but it, there is evidence to the fact that I may have sped through it. Musty, can I ask you about your thoughts of Chai? Because you're a big Lord of the Rings fan. I want to ask you about Chai. So Chai, Chai is conflicting to me. So so Chai is your like primary antagonist as far as the one who's like actually connected to you. Um, he is referred to as a skinhead, although he is um, like to me, he feels like like if you took Sagat from Street Fighter Two and gave him a like crack addiction, like that's kind of what I think. We're, we're dealing with here because he's got like the he's got the bandages on his on his ankles he's kind of like a like a jujitsu fighter but he i don't know how they because this game clearly was in development for a little while lord of the rings fellowship of the ring came out in 2001 how did these two properties get get so close of a character including the voice like uh there was a comment made in that in that podcast that you referenced ryan where the guy was like andy circus should pay him royalties like you should mm -hmm. see if he he's played shenmue before because there's some yeah it is straight up serving the precious like all over the place it was it was very very strange it was it kind of took me out of the experience in the moments that he showed up because at one point you meet him in the arcade and then he proceeds to uh, steal your, your, was it 70,000 or like 58,000 yen uh, boat ticket to, to Hong Kong that, that you have say that you managed to just get funds from all your good friends and your, and your aunt. Is that his aunt? That's not his mom. His so, aunt. so according to the strategy guide, she is a housekeeper, but he's known her his entire life, and essentially she is like a mother figure to him. Okay. Nissan. Okay. Yeah. And I um, didn't know if she had a relationship with we don't know yeah. this, whether you know she was connected to the the father or she I didn't realize that she was a, she was like a servant, a servant that had just sort of grown from there. Mm -hmm. So then is is focus on her son? He is a, a living student of his father. So he was learning alongside, but living with the family. But essentially, he's kind of like best friends with Rio. Gotcha. Rio. Okay. But you you have comments on, on Chai in there? No, I just I was just generally curious because... So weird. Well, so I knew going into this about Chai, I, I kind of wanted to see your reaction via the stream about it because I knew about him. This is, I you know, I played this game before seeing Lord of the Rings. And then upon playing it, uh, maybe a year or two after the fellowship came out, basically, I was like, boy, these are very similar. You, you almost wonder if Andy Circus actually played the game and got some kind of inspiration because he does the same kind of mannerisms where he, he's like climbing around on roofs and he dangles mm -hmm. and granted, he's just like, like hunched over, like not mm -hmm. he's not a standing humanoid anymore. He's like he's like very low to the ground, like spider monkey kind of thing going Looking on. And teeth and kind of like Olam, too. And yeah, they had the teeth. They had the, the scraggly hair like. It was so bizarre. And he ends up being uh, your, well, in effect, two moments with him end up, end up kind of culminating this, this branch of, of the story for this, for this one game. That fight was not, the, the fight was not easy. And let me ask, let me ask you guys this. How did you feel? How did, how did you feel about that as a boss fight to finish the game? I'm going to throw one thing on real quick, too, to tack onto this. Sure. Did you guys like this bet, that fight better or this the fight against the 70 Mad Angels? Because that's kind of like, there's like two final fights, in my opinion. And the first one is the, the fight against the whole gang of the Mad Angels. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the part with, with Chai at the end. I mean, they're both very back-to-back. -back. I don't know. I just with, uh, with the, you learned a new move sandwiched mm -hmm. in between it. So, I mean, I'll go first. I'll go first. 
that yeah, that fight is pretty difficult with with Chai. Um, but I I kind of discovered a, I don't know if it was a glitch or a loop with this time fighting him. Uh, and that was basically he kind of got if I got him against the wall, I could keep grabbing him and punching, like doing the grab and punch and then throw, and I could pick him up and keep doing that over and over and again. Musty, I saw you actually actually did the move that you just learned against him, I, I believe, where you trip him and kick him in the head. But I couldn't pull it off against him. He's not easy. You can't kick him because he's low to the ground, too. So he's kind of hard to kick unless he swings through your leg. But, yeah, well, and, and you've really got to be good on on predicting his move to be able to pull off that, that mm-hmm. dodge and, like, kick, punch, flip. Mm-hmm. And then they tell you to strike at that point, but you don't ever really get the chance to strike. But I'll say real quick, though, I, I prefer the fight against the 70 Mad Angels, not because it's easier. I, I just kind of like the fact that they keep sending more and more guys, and eventually, you know, a couple guys get weapons, and eventually you get a couple of the, the big guys. And I, I think I, I just like the uh, the build to, to getting to Terry. I kind of like that, that you're alongside fighting. Granted, your partner doesn't help you the most, but you're fighting alongside... um. Guizong. I just I think that's kind of a neat build up to it too. I don't know that my general thoughts on the final two fights of the game. Did any of you guys have have comments on those fights, Mike? Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I preferred like uh, what. Yeah, I prefer like what Ryan said the seventy uh, fight just because I found that uh, Chai kept on reversing everything I was throwing at him and just trying to get him on a string of like two or three hits it was near impossible. Like he's either too low to the ground or if I throw a kick, he goes underneath me and kicks me in the back of the head or or whatever so i found that with the 70 the 70 men that like when you're going at least you could string a few fight like a few hits and one punches knock them out it felt like all the fighting that you were building up throughout the whole game culminated to this moment so all those moves that you were learning and trying to and trying to master and all that led to this moment where you could actually let loose and go against these 70 guys uh, and I found that Terry was one of my favorite characters in the game just because, you know, he, he goes, uh, you know, he wants you to kill Huizan and then you have that one-on-one battle with him and you're, and you're you know, you're having little moments where it's like, oh, hit me here. No, don't do this. Don't do that. Like, so it seemed like they were, obviously they were in cahoots, but at the beginning it seemed like, you know, Rio was going to, you know, trying to kill him. But at the end it's like, no, okay, let's, let's work hand in hand. And, and, uh, Let's, let's take uh, Terry or take Chai down together. I like that uh, a lot. Like I said, the, the whole buildup of this fighting and learning these moves, finally doing it, being able to pull them off with no reversals or not many reversals throughout the whole game uh, in the 70 battle was uh, one of my favorites. So the last guy, I, I fought to the last guy like three times and he just beat me on some something so stupid. Like, you know how you're supposed to be able to run and regain your stamina? I would take two steps and be exhausted. And I was like, oh, Jesus, one punch and I was done. Yeah. And again, and I found it, I kept on doing that, trying to just get regain some stamina. And, uh, you know, I was exhausted every single time. But I found that more of a, like, fulfilling than fighting Chai because you fought him three times and every time he kicked your ass. Yeah. I found that if, even though you did finally get your, you know, just desserts on him, it just seemed like, the, the fight just didn't want to end. Reverse, reverse. Okay, two punches, reverse. Punch, 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 kick, reverse. So I found the 70 men tried. Uh, I enjoyed a lot more. Excellent. Eric, did you uh, did you have a preference of those two kind of final encounters? Or did, did you... What about the QTE after the fight with Chai? <laughs> well, I'll answer that part first. I mean, at this point of the game, I was ready for it to to kind of end. And I thought that the ending of the game kind of dragged on a little bit. You know, it, it seemed like one of those, if you'll pardon the comparison, Musty, it seemed like, you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy where it had like three different endings to it. And sure. um, uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I maybe shouldn't have known. Of course, I got caught off guard at the QTE. And so I had to do it again. Uh, every time I fought Chai, he he kicked my butt. So I wasn't a huge fan of his. So the short answer is, yeah, I, I like the 70 man fight better and I was ready for the game to kind of wind down there. And I thought that the whole battle with Chai at the end was maybe it was the time of night or whatever I was playing. And I was like, OK, this is really unnecessary. I don't I don't like this guy. He's too hard to beat. 
why are they dragging this on? Everything seems to be kind of wrapping up. It's clear what's going to happen. They're just delaying this one last time to to mess with you. I could have done without it. And Miles, did you did you want to comment on any of that, or you? Well, I I, I got to agree with everybody. Like like Eric just said, I was I thought the game had a bunch of endings, just like lord of the rings we keep talking about lord of the rings but the ending of lord of the rings you know how it just keeps ending it's like i just saw an ending i will say if anyone's curious about what 90 million dollars buys you in 1999 check out that 70 man fight sequence because that was some good stuff i was into that i did that one like maybe three times i died whatever i suck at these games (laughs) Uh, and then in the last boss i think i died five or six times before i finally got it yeah, they did a nice job mixing up the, the 70 man fight. They did a nice job mixing up the player models, right? It wasn't like you were just dealing with three guys. Uh, there was the Cosby sweaters. There was the shirtless guys. There was the white tank top and suspenders. There, <laughs> there was the I super was, tall guy. Uh, I always like in fighting games when there's like one type of sprite that just has a mesh shirt on. And you're <laughs> like, that's one of the that's one of the standards. You know how you see all these people walking around with mesh shirts? I, I don't know. You got the whole like YMCA deal going on. There's the the guy who screams Sega. And, uh... That's right. You knock him out and he goes, Sega! Oh no, that was when he hits you. Yeah. He, he hits you with punch. the Sega attack. That's right. But yeah. I, I, I agree. I, I, I like the 70 man battle. I think if they would have set it up to where like that was you getting back Nozomi, I don't know why I want to make this game a love game. Like, like one with a love story because, but it seems like that's what I'm trying to do here. And it's interesting because this game would have come out when I would have been the same age as Rio. I just didn't have a dreamcast. And so, so there are other games that, that sort of filled that void for me, but I don't know for some, for some reason I keep wanting him to get the girl and to not carry out his, self uh self-imposed mission to like just walk away man just just let it happen like i don't, I don't think this is the last we've seen of nozomi so i, I can't be wearing that. the same sweater at that point do you think and, and skirt and skirt <laughs> and skirt yeah. sorry i was just hoping that uh like how everybody said how the the ending just kept on ending and the chai battle wasn't it wasn't necessary which i totally agree i wish it was just the 70 man battle obviously goes to your ending and Chai is on the ship and you like it cuts to his face smuggled on the ship. Ooh, like a like a like a teaser after credit yeah. kind of deal. Like yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're gonna you're gonna meet him again, kind of thing, rather than just okay, this and then you kick him in the water and that's basically it, right? So <laughs> that's right. Ah, I would like to see the boat going away and Ryu dive in and just start swimming to China. <laughs> <laughs> Be like, this is a this is a way for a free travel. <laughs> oh yeah, and then uh, and then Guizong's ability to to kick an I beam away like it's like it's nothing was uh, that moment was pretty uh, pretty well, fantastic. Japanese steel isn't as strong as American steel, so I imagine you know uh, that's probably what it is. Give it that's a couple like, years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about music because. We were just talking about the Nozomi part, and I don't want to forget to bring up the motorcycle song, which I think is fantastic. That's the one of the only songs in the game I can think of that has lyrics to it, and it starts in Japanese and ends in English, and I love the song. I, I think it's great. Is, is it my that a representation of her moving to Canada? Mm-hmm. It's that it starts in Japanese and ends in English. And I made Thanks. you turn it up on your stream too. I made I made you turn it up the volume for the. Oh yeah, I mean, well, you you alerted me to it, so I was like, okay, let's do this.
but I I love that song and I I love the theme. It it it's you know, and I can think back to the reveal of Shinmu three when I heard just that like opening strings playing for the chorus. Like I had that that uh Michael Huber, I had that same general reaction except I had like a piece of pizza in my hand. Dude, this is a crazy. Because I, I didn't think I would ever see the day of uh, the third game ever come from this series. So I had, they said, like, I love that theme. And it, as soon as I can hear that opening string, I think of this game. So, wow. Yeah. I, I saw that video. That was an, that's an incredible reaction. I wish I had knew, known the music at that point when that reveal was done, but uh, I hadn't played the game yet. So. I found that a lot of the, like, music was just kind of thematic for the areas did you guys have uh, a track that really stuck out to you or there was was there a certain area that you liked to be around because of the music let's go with mike uh i liked uh when you were at your house it had that ambiotic sound like i don't know i, don't, I, I only put it but towards a like, kill bill where there's that that scene where the water fills like a bamboo shoot and it drops and it keeps on making this sound so like when you're at home, it's, there's like this um, ambient sound that every time you walk into like the the main gates, it just sounds like uh, this water shooting down like a, this bamboo shoot, and it just drops when it fills up and it goes up again. And it just this the ambient sounds that you, you get in at home. I just like that like the home homey feel. I, I like I, I enjoyed that a lot more than uh, like obviously you have your your main chord or your main strings of. Of, uh, the, of the of the game, but I found that every time you came home to that, every time you opened the door, there was that one thing. I'm just and it always took me to Kill Bill. Like every time I uh, listened to that, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, I couldn't put that what it was. And then when I watched Kill Bill, and I'm like, that's what that stupid sound is. Like it just, just like I didn't know what it was, but then when I saw Kill Bill and that one scene, and this thing filled with water hits it, makes this this knocking sound, and it fills back up and. And in that moment, I'm like, that's what that thing was. That whole time I was trying to trying to piece it together. But yeah, I always love, I love the like the homey feel, like that 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 that, that tune that plays. Eric, did you have a other than the space harrier theme? <laughs> yeah, the space harrier thing. Well, I did like the music at the Hazuki household also, but um, honestly, I think most of the music was um, it. Um, I don't know what the right word for this is. It was it was appropriate for its it was um, ambiance. It was it was there to establish the location that you were at, and so I found most of them to be very appropriate and and, and uh, it was pretty good. And uh, there's only one that really sticks out to my mind, and that is of course the one at the tomato convenience store. That's like the only one that to me it sticks. It almost sticks out like a sore thumb because it's so different from the rest of the music. But I don't know that I would say that I liked any of the music more than any other. I, I thought I thought it was all great, and it all did exactly what I think it needed to do, which was sort of establish the environment. I was going to say, if I had to pick one, I'm saying Tom's boombox. Music was playing in there. That was always fun. And you could just see him just sort of jam into the whole thing, which was nice. Ryan, did you have did you have music uh, that that uh, stuck out to you, or are you sticking with the uh, the the theme the theme? I guess it's the theme song. The, the theme is my is my favorite track in the whole game. But I'll, I'll point this out too. There's a lot of tracks that are the same in this game, so I, uh, I could see why someone would say like a lot of the tracks sound the same because there are the same track. It's just done a different way. Uh, like there's a like an upbeat version of the Shenmue theme song. There's there's quite a few tracks. So if you ever listen to the OST, which which I do, because this is one of my I love the soundtrack for these games. You know, I think Ryan's saying that because he knows my feelings about how all the songs kind of sound the same. I went into a place and there was a jukebox, and I I picked Jazz Night. And I played a song, and then I put in another one of my hard-earned 
allowance quarters. And I put it in and I picked Monkey Business or some other, I don't know what it was called. And it was the same song. And I was like, guess we're done here. That's all the music in the game. <laughs> and then I promptly walked out, went into the casino where I played slot machines. And let me tell you, we haven't talked about the slot machines yet. Something nobody's going to warn you about. You cannot exchange your, your tokens for money. You can put all your money in the slot machines and you can never cash out, which is my biggest problem with Shenmue. <laughs> Yikes. That I didn't... I. I think I, at one point I realized that I had tokens in my inventory, but I did not realize that you couldn't get them back into cash. Well, well tokens won't be in your inventory because as soon as you leave, the guy who runs the, the casino takes your tokens from you. So you can't even take the tokens. You can't get money for the tokens and you can't even leave with your tokens. And on top of that, in Japan, it's illegal to gamble. So I understand why they did that. But in Japan, you win prizes and they have pawn shops next door that you sell your prizes to for money. So Shenmue. I honestly I want to start Shenmue 2 with my money from that casino. That's how I feel about it. Well, <laughs> since since you bring that up, tying it into the second game, with moves that you learn and your money that you have left over from the first game if you played the dreamcast or the hd re-release that stuff will carry over to the second game that stuff the stuff that you learn and that you have in the first game does even your little your little toy figures that carry over to the second game and so but <laughs> eric's immensely relieved yes if you, if you play if you play the dreamcast version unless you have i guess the uh the repro, like i have the repro then you cannot yeah, you, you know, can't you can't Carry it sucked over. because yeah, uh, like I put put it in and say, like, "You want to import the last save?" I put import and it doesn't let you do it, and it's like, "Oh, oh that's great." Mm -hmm. So, yeah, wait start a minute, from scratch. The Dreamcast Shenmue Two won't import from your Dreamcast save. Well, what's the difference between the Repro and the UK yeah. import? The UK well doesn't because it's not an American disc. Basically, you won't realize recognize it as like the same memory card save. Okay, I, I think what I'm hearing is. There's no way to import into any version of Shenmue 2 the U.S. save game. The HD release there is. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm entering. Yeah, yeah, okay, got it. Uh, if you're on the PAL in Japan version, if you have the console for, and you have the PAL in Japan version, then you can import. But North American, as far as I know, I don't think you can import. Gotcha. Gotcha, thanks. If you are so inclined to dive into the series, I do want to say that if you do play the original Xbox, or if you buy the original Xbox version, there is... Shenmue the movie, which is the a take on all of the well, not all, but most of the cutscenes from the game, uh, including some of the combat sequences and some of the quick time events, stringed together as a ninety minute movie, uh, and it's not a bad way to watch it. It was actually a great way for me to kind of refresh on some of the story stuff that I had kind of missed or stuff that I had just forgotten over time so if that's your deal and you'd rather do that you can also do that so i want to i want to make sure that we don't miss anything that you guys want to still address were there any other components about the game that you wanted to talk about before we kind of get into community impressions i kind of wanted to ask miles a question because he's a fan of the Yakuza series and i think how he feels about Yakuza is how I feel about Shenmue because I've heard over these years and he heard the same exact thing that, that he's, Yakuza is kind of like the spiritual successor to Shenmue. So in my head going into playing Yakuza, I'm thinking I'm getting Shenmue here. I'm getting Shenmue, just, just a different character with the same exact game. And it is not that you, you see the elements here, but it's not the same game. And, and like, I guess part of my my gripes against Yakuza, and I like Yakuza, but part of my gripes is like, here I am coming from a game where I explore this world and I could take my time and I'm not worried about getting in fights, this, you know, every minute uh, to playing Yakuza where I'm walking down the street and everyone's trying to jump me. So it's kind of like, uh, it's, you know, like there's these these differences here in the game. I, I see the uh, resemblance but it wasn't the game I was looking for. I had this idea in my head what 
Yakuza was, and it was not that. Do you feel the same way, Miles, about Shenmue? Like, I, I think that's a great question, and to address it, I would first have to bring up the predecessor to Shenmue, which is River City Ransom. And I think that Shenmue borrows a lot from River City Ransom, uh, you know, coming out on the, the NES, going into stores. You're worried about your girlfriend, but you have time for a hot sauna. Like, there's there's a lot of similarities between River City Ransom and and Shenmue. And I think that Shenmue did such a drastic turn by not having combat in the first half of it. And I think that Yakuza borrows that from River City Ransom and makes mixes it with, with all of the amazing things that Shenmue created. So, Ryan, if Shenmue's your favorite series, I think I'm on board with you. I think that if you count River City Ransom all the way to Yakuza as one series, which I think there's a really good argument for, then I think that the, we have the same favorite franchise of all time. Oh, best friends. <laughs> best dudes. And I'm not just saying that because you're the executive producer on my podcast. Oh, I appreciate <laughs> that. That's uh, perfect. So, Ryan, I think I think that's going to do it for our take on Shenmue. But uh, I do want to ask you if there were any community submissions or people who were commenting about the game uh, throughout the month. So I want to give a plug out to our own friend from the Cartridge Club, Dean, at Round 2 Gaming. He wrote an amazing review for Shenmue. And I'm going to give that a plug right here. And I think everyone should go check it out. He did one for both games because he was fairly new to the franchise. And after seeing the announcement for Shenmue 3, he he got all excited about that E3, and he had to see what the hype was about. And he went back and played Shenmue for, for the first time on the Dreamcast, and it was his first Dreamcast game he ever played. And I think he wrote a really good review. So I, I kind of want to give that a little plug right here for, for things the community to check out. We should also point out that Scott uh, from Scott's Game Asylum also posted uh, a review for Shenmue to the website, cartridgeclub.org. If uh, if hearing us five talk about it was not enough and you want another take on it as well, uh, he does some nice deep dives into the reviews that he does. And so you may want to take a look at that too. And with that being said, that's the show, everyone. And, uh, before we go, I want to thank our panel for being here today. So we have Mike. Where can we find you on the internet? Uh, well, I do a uh, you do have a YouTube channel, the Retro Lectors. If you guys search that up on YouTube, you can find me on Twitter at Retro Lectors, Instagram at Retro Lectors, Facebook page the Retro Lectors. It's pretty much all in uh, in tune there, minus the or with it. And I would thank thank you guys for having me on on this podcast cast because I, I, you know sharing this passion that we all have about video games and this game in particular i like thank you guys for having me next up we have eric from uh, mighty q dog where can we find you on the internet okay so my wife and i we have a youtube channel called mighty q dog that's d-a-w-g and you can also find us both on twitter i'm mighty q dog and she is mrs q dog and i'd also like to reiterate uh mike's thanks uh, thanks for having me on again I was, uh, again, really uh, excited to play Shenmue, and the Cartridge Club was just the, uh, just the push I needed to uh, finally play this, uh, this Sega masterpiece. So thank you. And last but not least, Miles, where can we find you on the internet? Hey, you can find me on Flock of Nerds. It's a YouTube channel and a podcast. What? The podcast is called Flock Doc. And the YouTube channel is youtube.com slash flock of nerds. Uh, we do a Mario Mondays and it's pretty good. Rocket Sauce is the executive producer. Mm -hmm. And for myself, you can find me on, on Twitter at it's Rocket Sauce. I also have an Instagram that I post my pickups. And uh, so, yeah, you can find me at the, at the same name at it's Rocket Sauce. And I am mostly on the Tuesday Cartridge Club Hangouts. So you can find me there, too. So, Musty, where can we find you? Yeah, so most uh, the social media of choice for me is Twitter, and that's at Musty Hobbit. And lately, uh, in fact, the past couple of months, I've been pushing really hard on uh, a lot of what I do is on Twitch lately. So I've been streaming the game of the month, Final Fantasy VIII, among other things. And you can find me at twitch.tv slash Musty Hobbit. I do also have my YouTube channel as well, Second Breakfast. And there will still be stuff coming down the pipeline for that one of these days. 
But again, we want to thank, yeah, thank all of you for coming by and thank you to those who took the time out of their night to come watch us live as we did this and to those who are listening at home. I do want to mention again that we are a game of the month podcast and therefore we do have a game for next month and that's June. Our June game of the month for Cartridge Club Prime is going to be Uncharted 2 Among Thieves and that is either available on the PS3 or on the PS4 as part of the Nathan Drake collection. We're very excited for the pair of guys that we'll have on as guests for Drake 2. Additionally, uh, we will, Ryan and I, uh, will be soon doing something where we reveal the first half of Season 7. Keep an ear out for that. Uh, it will be roughly around the time of E3. So you want to check that out or check out the forums where we'll list the new games once we have announced those. Uh, also want to give a shout out to our sister podcast, CC Portable. And for the month of June, they will be playing in honor of the 30th anniversary of Batman. They will be playing Batman on the Game Boy. So if you want to check that out, Curtis as well, will have uh, his show going at the same time. Uh, lastly, to those who are interested in supporting the club beyond a review on the podcast app of your choice, I'd like to again mention that the club is entirely funded by pledges made from members of our community. We are extremely grateful to those supporters. If you're interested in becoming one of them, please check out our offerings at patreon.com slash cartridge club. We look forward to hearing from you next month. CC Unite.